I'd like to welcome you all back to the next episode of Balladish and Ish Folklore Now. My name is Richard Blake, and this is my 15th broadcast of the podcast Folklore Now. And the last few episodes have focused largely on United States and specific states and how regional folklore works within each of those states. If I was to talk about some of these larger states, of course, I would have to kind of break things into regional sections in order to make it work. Some states are really large, and even the smaller ones have regional significance with a lot of things that you can go into some depth with. But I've actually decided to take a slightly different track here. I will go back to some folklore with other states at some time. This one, I this particular episode, I want to focus instead on the concept of landscape and folklore. I don't know if a lot of you really think about it, but when you go to different places, there are all kinds of different ideas about places and how they got their names or where people came, um, what the ancients thought of those particular places. Here in the United States, a lot of those legends do revolve around Native American legends and stories, and sometimes they pass on to American ideas as well. And of course, a lot of people who migrate from other areas to the United States or in other areas of the United States kind of bring a bunch of ideas with them. And so when they see a certain kind of cave or when they see a certain formation, they immediately relate that kind of formation to what they understood back in their homeland. And some examples of that, of course, are there are a lot of times springs and sacred pools that sit around different areas that are supposed to be healing wells or they're supposed to have mountains where the tops of them are where the gods happen to be able to be reached by those who wish to speak with them. There are places like coastlines where different ghostly spirits are said to haunt those areas because of different kinds of geological phenomenon that happened there. One example that I have been to and ha- and falls into that category is the boar, which I encountered down at Ensenada, Mexico. Before the tourists kind of went in there and took over the tourism industry and everything, there were different ideas as to what was causing that particular boar where the tide of the water swoops into that particular area and then shoots up like a geyser. And it is really interesting to sit and watch that. I was only there in Ensenada for a short time, and so I was only able to see a little bit of what was going on in that coastal Mexico area. And that is actually the only part of Mexico I've ever been to. I do want to, of course, go and see some of the areas there at some point. It, Mexico is one of the closer places one can go to in order to be a tourist. It's just that tourism has kind of taken over so much that a lot of old traditions have been warped to suit the ideas or the needs of the tourist industry. And so depending on where you go, there are certain places where you just have to find out, okay, what do some of the older sources have to say about this as opposed to what a website might tell you or what a tour guide is likely going to be telling you. And that kind of brings me to other areas that I actually find a lot more interesting in my studies. I talk a lot about maritime folklore and ghost stories, but there's other things that are kind of, they, they struck my interest a lot earlier in my studies of this, of this area. When I started studying folklore, I was really interested in the British Isles and kind of the Basque country and other Celtic places and the Norse, but I tended to focus on the British Isles. 
And there is so much intrinsic culture that has kind of evolved over the centuries for one reason or another. Because of the geography of the British Isles, a lot of areas were regionally cut off from each other. And so different ideas, different dialects of language or different things tended to wind up in those areas and stay there except with the occasional person who might happen to leave that area and go somewhere else. You might be surprised to find out that even though the island of Great Britain is not that big, compared to American standards, it is really not that big. But if you actually go to some of these places like in Wales and you start talking to some people, in the town of Crickieth, there is a castle uh, that's kind of run down and it's up on a hill. And when I visited Wales, uh, was this the last time I was in Wales? No, I think my second trip to Wales. And in this trip, I got on a bus to ride to Crickieth because I like castles. And when they're in interesting geological locations, a lot of times you like the geological location and how it looks and how the castle sits out there, kind of like how I feel about lighthouses and where they're located. Anyways, Crickieth Castle is kind of a rundown castle sitting up on a hill, but man, is it an amazing view to stand up on that hill. So on the bus on my way there, I happened upon someone who was sitting next to me on the bus, and he started telling me about some of the things that he had done growing up and how, you know, a lot of his children had moved away and everything, but He was 92 years old. He was born in Crickieth, Wales, and he remained there all those years, and he probably died there since this trip happened back in 2006. I'm assuming he's probably gone unless he's in in his late 100, um, like if he'd be like 110 right now if he was still alive. He told me, some things about Hibs growing up and how things have changed. And oddly enough, World War II, you know, where we hear about the Blitz and everything, didn't affect him all that much because in Northern Wales, there was really almost nothing going on during World War II except for, you know, people who may have been able to tune into radios and listen. And so, you know, isolation and regionalism kind of works to pretty much centralize things that are more important to someone in their lives than what might be seen on a worldwide scale. I'm sure that the draft did go through Wales as it did through England and Scotland and Northern Ireland, but Crickieth is such a small town that very few people probably were involved in the military, and fewer Brits actually left the British Isles throughout the beginning years of World War II. So, and at the time, he would have probably been, yeah, he would have been in his 30s or 40s at the time of World War II. So people, when they live in certain areas, have certain things that are more important to them. I did not get the impression that landscape itself was a heavy influence in his life, but regionalism, isolation, that creates a different perspective that is unique to that particular region. And of course, that leads to landscape. A lot of old stories that you might come across in the British Isles, some of them deal with the Romans, some of them deal with Celtic legends like King Arthur, some of them deal with early English encroachment into the British Isles, driving the Celtic people off westward, at least Celtic culture. Of course, there is a lot of evidence that maybe not a huge migration happened westward, but a lot of people just adapted because you adapt when things change. One of the things that you hear about, of course, is in the area of southern Wales, there is a hill where up until recently it kind of covered It sat over the plains near Carmarthen. Sorry if I butchered that word, that name, or whatever. I am kind of out of practice with pronouncing Welsh names and Welsh words. I hope to rectify that soon. Anyways, in this hill, there is a cave 
that has that was there from ancient time. And the name of the cave is Ogiv Kil Ir Ikin. Ogiv is the Welsh word for cave. And then Ir Ikin, I think it means oxbow or something like that. I'll have to ask someone exactly what that means because it's not a perfect English translation. Ogiv Kil Ir Ikin is a cave where supposedly King Arthur and his army went and hibernated and are currently in hibernation until Britain needs King Arthur to return and to free the island once again of invaders or to save the island from catastrophe. This cave, some people are said that, well, they don't know where it is. Others say, well, it's obviously right here. And of course, they were able to pinpoint it on a map. But then during the industrial, when Britain started to be industrialized, of course, they started going into places, you know, they start digging into hills, getting sand or coal or whatever else they want to mine for industrial purposes. So they start digging into these hills and everything. And of course, due to cave-ins and a lot of other things, a lot of hills have, especially with strip mining, a lot of hills actually collapsed or went down because of there's so many holes in the in the hill or the hill top was kind of notched out destroyed and several hills in wales and england of course have been reduced in size quite a bit recently you know some grass kind of grows over it over time and everything and so people don't realize what it used to look like this particular hill was reduced so much that Ogov Killer Ikin no longer exists. So if Ogov Killer Ikin no longer exists, what about King Arthur's army that is in there supposedly about come out and rescue the Britons from invasion from foreigners? And of course, I like to think about a lot of those kinds of things, how changing in the history of the world or changes in what we do today affect what original older legends happen to say about a certain place. So what happened to King Arthur's army is King Arthur's army kind of, was it destroyed? Some sources say that the army was asleep there and when a bell rang that the army was going to come out and do what it needed to do to free Britain. And the cave was supposed to be filled with riches and everything as well. And some people were said to have found it and they found these riches, but then they accidentally rang the bell and suddenly they dis the cave and everything they were in disappeared. So the landscape here, this cave is really significant. So is King Arthur's army destroyed? Is his army in a portal in another place? So it will rush out of the, in thin air to save the British Isles? Or what are we supposed to make of that? And then, of course, there are other places where King Arthur is supposedly sleeping with his army as well. So eh, maybe he's transported himself over to that particular cave or something. But every section even wales itself of course has its own little regionalism and so they all have a lot of them have their understandings of where king arthur's army is actually hibernating this of course is one of those conundrums that you'll have to think about as time progresses and you think about folklore the folkways and landscape Now that I've talked about the Arthurian story and how the story of his army hibernating somewhere has kind of evolved into many different places where his army is supposed to be hibernating, I want to go into another area in which landscape plays an important role. There's a website here where we read about a lot of things that are sacred to the Celts. There's this page that I'm looking at is called Into the Woods and then Water, Wind, and the Sacred. You can judge a lot of places by their titles, their names, as to what their sacredness is. As you look through a lot of the current names of locations, you'll notice that a lot of them are actually 
canonized and they are made sacred to saints as St. Bridget's Well or some lake that has a saint's name on it. Uh, St. Kibbe is supposed to be the origin of the name of Kyrgyzbe or Holyhead is the English way of saying that name. And apparently St. Kibbe is supposed to have gone there and done some miraculous things and to have pretty much helped to organize religion in that area. But now to focus back on the website that I had discussed. The website, of course, is Myth and More Into the Woods. I probably gave you a slightly altered title there before, but that's what it says on the main page. And this was written, it's kind of a combination of someone's account of travels done through the land of Wales and Britain into several of these older sites that were part of the religious and sacred landscape going back a long time. And so I'm going to read what it says here at the beginning that talks about the personal experiences that someone has. And then it evolves into research into sacred sites and their relationship with Celtic beliefs and older Celtic traditions. So, on a bright, clear morning some years ago, during the long, lovely days leading up to the summer solstice, Wendy Froud and I drove through the lanes to the village of Callington in Cornwall, the county just to the west of Devon. We parked at the edge of the farmyard and followed what was then an overgrown footpath to Dipoth Well, originally through Path Well, a deeply magical place buried in the greens of the Cornish countryside. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Cornwall is actually a place of strong Celtic traditions, even though their Celtic language is kind of, some people will argue it's dead and some will argue otherwise. But anyways, Cornwall and Wales have a lot in common with these early traditions. Like other holy wells in Devon and Cornwall, the spring that runs through Depeth Well is believed to have been a sacred site to Celtic peoples in the distant past, its oldest use now overlaid with gloss of Christian legendary. At one time, this spring may have sat at the woodland grove of oak, rowan, and thorn, trees sacred to the island's indigenous religion. In 1510, a group of Augustinian monks claimed the Dupath site for their own use, enclosing the spring in a small well house made out of rough-hewn granite. This was a common fate for many of the ancient pagan sites in the West Country. Unable to dissuade the local people from visiting the sacred places in nature, Christian authorities simply took them over, building churches where standing stones once stood, and baptistries over sacred springs, cutting down ceremonial groves, and putting wood hinges to the torch. There are many, many wells, like Dipath Well, scattered all over the West Country, some of them covered and some still in use, often named now for the saints and associated with their miraculous lives. But scratch the surface of these legends, and the palimpsests of older tales emerge. Stories of fairies and piskies, the knights of King Arthur, and the old gods of the land. Inside the tiny chapel-like building erected over Dupath Well, the water pools in the shallow trough carved from a single granite slab. The air is thick, heavy with shadows and with the ghosts, perhaps, of men and women drawing to the spot for many centuries. The stones are worn where they once knelt and prayed to the Virgin Mary or to the Lady of the Waters. That day, on the bottom of the trowel lay a handful of copper coins, a modern custom of making wishes that is not so very different from the older practices of throwing pins associated with women's labor and magic into the spring to ask for the water spirit's blessing. Wendy places a small offering of wildflowers by the water, which too is an ancient practice, recalling a time when it was land itself our ancestors thanked for the gift of water and life itself. So as we see here, 
the people are continuing to use these particular locations in a similar way as they had before and just as we do in modern times using things to make wishes these people are giving offerings so your tradition of throwing things into a wishing well is really just an offshoot of throwing in offerings to the gods into a certain location in order to curry favor of one sort or another and then of course this continues on by talking about how sacred and how important the locals had considered water and the need for it today with clean water piped directly into our homes and largely taken for granted it takes a leap of imagination to consider how precious water would have been to those who fetched it daily from the riverside or village well deeply dependent on good local water sources it's only natural that our ancestors would have revered these places where pure life-sustaining water emerged like magic from the depths of the earth water plays a central role in myth folk tales fairy lore and sacred stories not only here in the rain-soaked British Isles, but all around the globe, particularly, of course, in arid lands where the gift of water is most precious. Of course, the British Isles aren't one of those arid lands. They're talking about the Middle East in that instance. But wherever you go and you see certain formations, certain kinds of wells that are like sitting there on the edge of a rock formation or sitting there in a lake surrounded by groves, that is considered sacred to the native peoples there in the British Isles and there are several stories and legends that have come out through a lot of those as well some of them have found their ways associated with saints but others still have an attachment to fairy creatures of some kind believe it or not I guess to those who aren't already aware that there are a lot of people who do believe in fairies today and they take it very seriously there are groups that do what they call the serious research into the discovery of fairies and analyzing what they can to discover what they can about them I've even known some people who are religious who believe that there are some things in nature that can't be explained any other way than that there is some kind of supernatural power involved in what you see around you and what you're feeling when you go to certain places. Going back to the website, I am now going to talk to you a little bit about some of the examples of these kinds of natural phenomenon. And like I said, they are found in many places all over the island of Britain. Here's what one part of the website says. To the ancient peoples of the West Country, certain waters were deemed to have healing properties and thus were under divine protection. The famous hot spring at Bath in Somerset, the county just to the east of Devon, was dedicated to a Celtic goddess located in that place. When the Romans took the hot spring over and built the temple complex we know today, Sulis was linked with the goddess Minerva to become Sulis Minerva. Chalice Well in Glastonbury, also in Somerset, is reputed to be among the oldest of continually used holy wells in all of Europe. Archaeological evidence suggests it has been a sacred site for at least 2,000 years. Even the standing stones and circles of Britain are generally found near wells or running water. Going back to Bath, which is a well-known city, of course, on the island of Britain in England, if you go to see what is called the Roman Baths, you can go and there's this enclosed location where there's a pool. It's pretty much shaped like a square there's a stone structure that's got sort of a square sort of bathtub shape and then underneath that is the interesting looking colored water of the natural springs there and the water is naturally warm and therefore of course it has been giving sort of some supernatural aspects attributed to it that were part of the worship of Sulis Minerva. Of course the Romans like to turn older gods and goddesses of one religion into some form of their own 
religious belief. The uh, goddess Minerva, of course, is the Romanized version of the goddess Athena. And because she is attributed with kind of healing properties, that is, Sulis has contributed healing properties, they had to go and find a Roman god that they can use to kind of tack onto it so that everyone can really have a good understanding of what's supposed to be worshipped there. So with Bath, if we go back to the springs the that were closed off with a Roman temple, and then of course it got Christianized and made into a saintly retreat for the higher ups to go and take advantage of these nice baths that are naturally warm. When archaeologists went and started pulling things out of there, you'll find out that there were a whole bunch of people who had put offerings into this water, just like they do in many holy wells. And, of course, we find some things in the River Thames as well, and some people had thrown offerings into that. And so whenever there's a body of water that does seem to have its own certain properties, special attributes that are divine, people do start throwing offerings in there, hoping that their desires will come true. Sulis Minerva, of course, would be someone that you would go to to try and help overcome your ailments. If you are having a huge back problem or if you're really ill, the areas of bath and sacrificing there are supposed to help to heal your ailments. Going back to the paper here that I was reading, As Christianity spread, more and more springs were built over with chapels and well houses, and the groves around them removed. Devon and Cornwall, in particular, were deemed to be troublesome bastions of paganism. In the 5th century, a canon issued by the Second Council of Arles stated, If in territory of the bishop infidels light torches or venerate trees, fountains or stones and he neglects to abolish this usage he must know that he is guilty of sacrilege a lot of early christians were trying to eliminate all potential layovers from the old religion so that the more pure christian religion can take over of course what happened instead was that the old religion fused with the new religion so that like i said the holy wells that we come across are holy for both Christians and for the Romans and the pre-Romans as well for how they saw the world and what they understood. Of course, on the website further on, it does pretty much say just what I just said. I'll read this to you because I think it does it more articulately than I did. So over time, however, pagan and Christian practices slowly blended together and holy wells all over Great Britain were celebrated with Christian festivals that fell on the old pagan holidays. On the Island of Man, for example, holy wells are frequented on August 1st, a day sacred to the Celtic god Lu. August 1st is Lamas in the Christian calendar, but the older name for the holiday, Lugnasad, sorry if I butchered that, was still in use on the island until late into the 19th century. So even up into the late modern age, there were still people who were pretty much performing the rites and possibly even worshipping these particular entities. And in Scotland, the well at Loch Marie is dedicated to St. Malruva, but it is annual rites involving the sacrifice of a bull and offering milk poured on the ground and coins driven into the bark of the tree are pagan in origin. The custom of well-dressing is another Christian rite with pagan roots. During these ceremonies, still practiced in Derbyshire and other parts of Britain, village wells are decorated with pictures made of flowers, leaves, seeds, feathers, and other natural objects. In centuries past, The wells were dressed to thank the patron spirit of the well and frequent good water for the year to come. Now the ceremonies generally take place on Ascension Day, and the pictures created to dress the wells are biblical in nature. Of course, they are Christianizing it. The Christian tale attached to springs and wells are often as magical as any to be found in Celtic lore. Wells were said to 
have sprung up where saints were beheaded or had fought off dragons or where the virgin mary appeared to the left small footprints pressed into the stone over the channel in Brittany, which has linguistic and mythical connections to the west country granny wells dedicated to saint anne so called because anne was the mother of mary and therefore the grandmother of Christ, were attributed with particular powers concerning fertility and childbirth. And then up until the 19th century, the holy wells of the West Country were still considered to have miraculous properties and were visited by those seeking cures for diseases, disability, or mental illness. And of course, the website goes on into several other places. Of course, you know, water divinities, water spirits, they are really common and have even found their way into things like King Arthur's tale with the Lady of the Lake who comes out and assists him to pretty much give him his sword Excalibur and who also took it back after King Arthur's death. And King Arthur is also to say to be protected by the Lady of the Lake somewhere, going back to King Arthur hibernating somewhere. Then you can clearly see as I demonstrated and I read in that particular website and other areas how landscape and folklore are intertwined and often bring into focus a lot of religious things that were really important because of how our landscape is laid out. There's a story in history, a Roman story, that deals with landscape. You can argue that it deals with landscape and how the Romans felt they needed to destroy a forest in order to subdue a people who are constantly causing trouble to them with their conquests. Everybody probably knows or has heard about the Druids and about their sacred rites that they had performed. They are said to have a lot of sacred groves and things where or in similar natural places where they went to do their worship and perform their rites. On the island of Anglesey, back in Roman times, that was one of the more famous such sites. After the Romans had conquered Britain, there were many revolts and attempts of throwing off the Roman yoke. The Romans had decided that it was likely these Druids that were the inspiration for causing all of these ruckuses and uprisings against Roman rule. What they thought the solution was, was to go to Mona, what the Romans called it. Today it's called Innis Mon, you know, similar in origin, those names. And the sacred island of Anglesey, Mona, was where a lot of those sacred groves were. And they felt that they needed to go in there and destroy everything there to kill the religion of the Druids. As to whether or not destroying a place destroys that particular power, like I said, that just depends on their beliefs. The Druidic authority did definitely dwindle down pretty quickly after that. The Roman general Suetonius Paulinus in 60 AD went to Anglesey to subdue it. This actually happened around the same time as Boudicca's uprising in central England took place, and it was a very strong struggle before the final battle and the Romans of course did end up beating Boudicca but Paulinus took his army over into the island of Anglesey. When they got there to the Mane Strait which is the waterway between the island and mainland Wales on the other side there were Druids and the Celtic people there and they were performing ritual rites and casting out words probably casting spells or things to protect them against the Romans. A lot of the Romans probably got scared and creeped out by a lot of what was going on but of course the generals and leaders and the Romans at that time felt that well this is not going to stop us. These people have not stopped us in the past so here we go. Tacitus does not say exactly what happened just that they went in there they defeated these druids with their people who were fighting to protect Anglesey, Mona whatever and then they went and they destroyed the sacred groves they burnt them down you know on the island of Anglesey today there's very few trees to be found and who knows why that is if, if it would just never grew back after the Romans left or if it was some other reason. The landscape was very, very important to the Celtic peoples and their divinities. The power that nature provided was 
deeply intertwined within their religious beliefs. So I think this will bring our episode to a close, and I hope you all enjoyed our little reverie into landscape and folklore. There was another thing that I wanted to talk about concerning Vortigern and the British Isles and how landscape works within that framework, but it looks like I do not have enough time to do that. So thank you all for listening. As always, if you want to talk to me about something or if you want me to react to any particular aspect of folklore that I have not discussed, feel free to email me at folklorenow33 at gmail.com. And thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on the next episode of Balladish and Ish, Folklore Now.